Now, this title right here, this title right here just, just broke my brain. <laughs> when you're trying to read it, right? Hiker gets eaten alive and lives. Normally when you see a title like this, eaten alive or buried alive, you know, they die. But this, this crazy. Again, we are back with Mr. Ballin. This video is number eight on trending right now. That title is crazy. Again, appreciate y'all coming over. The Flannel King himself. Make sure you guys are subscribed to his channel. All right. This brother does a great job. The best I've seen at bringing you into the story, making you feel like you were there. All right. I've, I've done so many follow-ups and, and, and looked at articles and stuff like that from stories I've heard and been searching for movies. So again, appreciate y'all coming over. Shout out to all the good humans. Link is always in the description for those who are asking. Mr. Balling has merch as well. Make sure y'all check that out. So we ain't gonna waste no more time. Let's jump right into it. In order to appreciate today's story, I actually have to give something away right now. And oh. that is, the main character survives. The reason I have to tell you that is because during this story, there is a really intense event that happens. And I use really specific descriptions for how something looked, how something felt, how something smelled. And if you didn't know, I was pulling that from the survivor who lived to tell the tale. Mm. You might think I was just making it up, but I'm not. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, the next time the like button asks you to pick up some cereal for them, say yes and then go to the store and buy the big single biscuit shredded wheat cereal. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications what? so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. On July 19th, 2013, 49-year-old Matt Dyer climbed on board a tiny 19-seat twin otter airplane that was parked on the tarmac of the Montreal International Airport in Canada. Matt was about to take off on the first of two flights that would take him and seven other adventurous people deep into one of the most remote and wild regions in North America. For Matt, this trip was going to be the most amazing journey of his life. He had seen the ad for this two week long expedition about a year earlier when he was looking through a magazine put out by an environmental organization called the Sierra Club. Now, even though Matt was a lawyer, he didn't make much. Wait a minute. That how to not die doing this. I ain't doing it. If I got to get a book or look at something like that, hey, no. Of his life. He had seen the ad for this two week long expedition about a year earlier when he was looking through a magazine put out by an environmental organization called the Sierra Club. No. Now, even though Matt was a lawyer, he didn't make much money. He lived in this tiny town in central Maine where he made a living by offering either free or very low cost legal assistance for some of the state's poorest residents. But Matt was an avid outdoorsman. And when he saw the opportunity to explore one of Canada's newest national parks that was so far north, it was practically in the Arctic Circle, he decided the hefty $6,000 price tag was well worth it. Two and a half hours later, after flying over 900 miles due north away from the airport in Montreal, the Twin Otter airplane that Matt and the others were riding on touched down on a narrow gravel landing strip situated between this huge forest on a mountainside and a river on the other side. After climbing off the plane with all of their equipment, Matt and the seven others hustled their way over to the stretch of flimsy plywood buildings that lined the runway. These buildings and this entire area they were in was was not a part of this new national park they were going to. This was like their staging area to prepare and get ready before catching another flight that would bring them into the park. 
And so Matt and the seven other people he was with, which included the two trip leaders from the Sierra Club, they would stay at this temporary base camp for the next couple of days, going over their hiking routes and talking about emergency procedures and protocols. And then after those two days were up, the group felt like they were ready. And so the group packed up all their things and they boarded the tiny float plane out on the water that would take them to their final destination, this new Canadian national park, better known as the Torngat Mountains. 45 minutes later, the pilot of the float plane began to descend through the clouds to make their landing on a little water inlet. And as the pilot did that, Matt and the seven others were able to look out the window and actually see the Torngat Mountains for the first time. Now, all of them had seen dozens and dozens of pictures of this area, but seeing it for the first time in person was still shocking. The area looks like an alien. Yeah, that's, that's how I felt going to a... Uh when we were in Italy. You know, you see pictures and stuff and it's just, it don't do it no justice. When you get there, when you actually see stuff in person that it, it's like mind blowing, mind blowing. Now, all of them had seen dozens and dozens of pictures of this area, but seeing it for the first time in person was still shocking. The area looks like an alien planet. The wilderness in and around the Torngats is not the same kind oh, of wilderness no. we think of when we think about going hiking in the forest or going camping or something. No, the wilderness in the Torngats is primordial. It's like you're looking out at a place from the very beginning of time, like dinosaurs should be walking around this area. Damn. As far as Matt could see in any direction were these huge jagged mountains that had been carved out of the earth by glaciers hundreds of thousands of years ago. And those same glaciers had created hundreds of waterways between the mountains called fjords that almost looked like blue veined fingers. And even from high up in the plain, Matt could look down and the water of these fjords were so clear that he could see these speckled backs of brown trout swimming beneath the surface. But while this landscape was undoubtedly spectacularly beautiful and pristine and totally incredible, it was equal parts unwelcoming to people. There are no roads in the Torngats, there's no campsites, there's no facilities, there's no internet, there's no cell phone, and the weather is unbelievably harsh. It's freezing cold and no. wet most of the time. And then even when it's a little bit warm and a little bit nice there, the weather can change in an instant and become freezing cold and wet all over again. And so as such, the handful of visitors that go into this area every year are expected to be 100% self-reliant because this really is one of the most dangerous wild regions in the world. But for Matt, as he- Again, man, all these thrill seekers and adrenaline rush people, like all that stuff he listed that you don't have there and then how the weather can just change on you like that. Like, I mean, I, I understand to a point when people want to, you know, do things like this to a point, but like when he be telling stories, when people be like, oh, they wasn't prepared for this or this, or this, this is what I'm talking about. You got to go with the, the, again, just seeing that magazine, that ad, how not to die. Ain't no way. And full of visitors that go into this area every year are expected to be 100% self-reliant because this really is one of the most dangerous wild regions in the world. But for Matt, as he looked out his window and surveyed this landscape, he wasn't second guessing his decision to go into this hostile environment, no. I mean, the reason he was willing to fork over all that money to go on this trip is because he really wanted to experience extreme wilderness firsthand. And so finally, the pilot of the float plane came into land on this little water inlet, and then the pilot ferried the craft over to this beach, and then Matt and the seven others piled off onto land with all of their things, and then as the pilot turned around and left, the two Sierra Club trip leaders, a 61-year-old man named Rich Gross and a 60-year-old woman named Marta Chase, told the group to pick up their things and follow them. 
And so Rich and Marta led the hikers about 500 feet away from where they had just been dropped off up to this slightly elevated, mostly flat area that kind of overlooked the fjord and had this incredible view of all the mountains around them. Now, unlike the temporary base camp they had been at for the past couple of days, this camp was nowhere near any forests. They were basically on a wide open plain that kind of went right up into these mountains. So it's very wide open where they're staying. And so after Rich and Marta instructed the group where to set up their tents, Matt and the others got to doing that. And then after they were all set up, Rich and Marta put a small electric fence around the perimeter of their tents to keep any nosy animals out. And then the group headed up a little bit higher on this mountain near them to take their first group photo. And in this photo, they all look so happy and so excited for what's to come. And over the next couple of days, their trip would go exactly to plan. During the daytime hours, they would hike all of their pre-planned hiking routes all over the mountains and down near the water. And at night, they would eat their food and drink fresh water from the fjord and swap stories from back home. But their perfect trip was about to become a nightmare. Oh, here we go. After the ad. In the early evening hours of Tuesday, July 23rd, so two days after the group arrived in the Torngat Mountains, Matt and the others returned from one of their hikes. Now, the day had been cold and rainy, but the group was in good spirits. This was their last day at this particular camping spot. The next morning, they were going to pack up and head farther inland to their next camping spot. After Matt and the others had put their gear back inside of their tents, they came back out to see that Rich and Marta, the two trip leads, had organized a special feast for the group to celebrate the successful beginning of their trip. And so the group all sat around eating salami and crackers and drinking rum mixed with lemonade as they talked excitedly about the oh, next couple of days right, and what they could expect. At some point during the festivities, Matt was tired and so he broke away from the group. He climbed back inside of his tent, got inside of his sleeping bag, and before long, he was fast asleep. A few hours later, around 3.30 in the morning, Matt suddenly woke up. He had no idea what had woken him up, and so for a second, he just lay there listening to the outside world and just kind of staring straight up. Now, the moon was out that night, so there was some illumination, and as he looked straight up at the underside of his tent, he sees this huge figure move across the side of his tent and then stop right on top of him. And then before Matt's brain could process what was happening, this huge figure began pressing down on the fabric of Matt's tent. And so he's seeing his tent collapsing in on him. Matt's not doing anything. He's not saying anything. He's just watching in horror. And then suddenly the tent rips open and these two arms reach into the tent and they grab at Matt. And Matt threw his hands up in defense and screamed out for help. And as he did that, he suddenly felt this vice-like grip on the top of his head and then before long he was being pulled out of the hole in his tent out into the night and as Matt is being dragged along on the ground having no idea what's going on he can't move all he can hear is this crunching sound which he would later find out was the sound of his skull and jaw breaking and he started to smell this horrible rotten fish smell and then he felt what felt like saliva coming over his face and then Matt began kind of trying to look around because he couldn't really move his head and he noticed all he could see was white fur. And it was then that Matt realized he was in the jaws of one of the world's most powerful and deadliest predators. Standing 10 feet tall on its hind legs and weighing as much as 1,700 pounds, the North American polar bear sits right on top of the Arctic food chain. This man said, hearing, I don't know why I'm like trying to pop my knuckles to recreate the sound. I don't know what's, what's going on here. He said he could hear his jaw and his skull. Oh my goodness. And then the fish smell and saliva. Oh my goodness, man. And now this apex predator was dragging Matt by the skull down to the beach where Matt knew he would be eaten, even if Matt was still alive when the eating began. 
When the bear first ripped open Matt's tent and bit down on the top of his skull, Matt let out that scream and it actually woke up the entire camp. And one of the first people to emerge from their tents to see what was going on was one of the trip leaders, Marta. And so she jumps out of her tent and just three feet away from her, she sees this huge polar bear on its hind legs diving into the tent to get after Matt. And so Marta instinctively yells out to Rich to get his flare gun and she dove back into her tent to retrieve her own flare gun. But by the time she and Rich had both emerged gun in hand, this polar bear had already dragged Matt 200 feet away from the camp. And by this point, the other hikers in the group had also emerged from their tents. And after realizing what was going on, they just stood there absolutely paralyzed with shock, staring at this bear, dragging one of their companions down to the beach to be killed. Then after Rich fired his flare gun generally in the direction of the bear, it kind of snapped the group out of their paralysis. And then moments later, they were all screaming and banging pots and pans to try to terrify the bear into releasing Matt from its jaws. Matt couldn't hear the sounds of his companions calling out to try to save him, nor did Matt feel any pain. He was in shock. The only thing going through Matt's head as he was being dragged along the ground to the beach was, I'm going to die. I'm either going to die on the way to the beach, or when I get there, then when the bear starts eating me, I'm going to die. And when he thought about this, it was with a kind of eerie, calm detachment. Like he wasn't sad or mad. It was just kind of a fact. This was going to happen. Man. But as Matt was kind of making peace with his reality, Rich fired... D -d -d to hear that making peace with his reality when, when you when you pretty much know like there's nothing i don't care how hard i try there is nothing that i can do you know and and another thing is like you don't know how you gonna be until you're in that situation like i'm pretty sure they maybe discussed talked about animals and all this type of stuff but how he said they were just in shock, like they were, they couldn't move and stuff like that. That's what I'm talking about. So you can try to prepare yourself, but hey, that's why I ain't going. He wasn't sad or mad. It was just kind of a fact. This was going to happen. But as Matt was kind of making peace with his reality, Rich fired that flare gun shot and that ball of chemical fire exploded basically right in front of the polar bear's face. And the polar bear, who was startled by the flare, instinctively whipped its head to the side, up, and then down again, and it didn't let go of Matt. And so Matt was whipped like a ragdoll up and then was slammed down into the ground. And when Matt hit the ground, he heard the sound of his neck breaking. But as Matt was laying there, the bear released him from its jaws. And then behind Matt, the bear turned around and began walking away. And so Matt could hear the sound of its big paws moving away from him. And suddenly Matt's thinking, oh my God, I might survive this. And so he tried to lay as still as he possibly could so as not to attract any attention. And he began repeating in his head over and over and over again, please bear, go away. Away. Please bear, go away. But as if out of a horror movie, as Matt is laying there repeating this phrase, he hears the sound of this bear stopping, turning around, and start moving back towards him. And so Matt's just thinking, okay, it's going to come back over here. It's going to bite my head. And that's the end. But luckily, Rich, by this point, one of the trip leads, had run down closer to the beach, reloaded his flare gun, and right as this bear was going to bite Matt again, Rich had fired that flare, and once again, the chemical fire had kind of exploded right near the bear, causing it to get startled, it turned around, it ran off, and this time the bear did not return. It would turn out Rich and Marta, the two trip leaders from the Sierra Club, had chosen a location for this campsite that was so heavily trafficked by polar bears, it was referred to as a polar bear highway.
See, this is this 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 is the stuff that pisses me off. I don't get pissed off too often. I don't. But this this stuff right here. That man just said a polar bear highway. Let me make sure I heard that right. It would turn out Rich and Marta, the two trip leaders from the Sierra Club, had chosen a location for this campsite that was so heavily trafficked by polar bears, it was referred to as a polar bear highway. When all of the hikers, which included Marta and Rich, had been given their safety brief when they were staying in those plywood structures at that base camp near the runway, well, part of the brief was whenever you make camp in the Torngots, you want to be at least a quarter mile away from water. Go way inland because the polar bears hunt and fish and walk around right along the edge of these fjords. But despite all seven members of this Sierra Club expedition being experienced wilderness backpackers, none of them really appreciated just how dangerous it was to be camping See? or even hiking around in known polar bear That's territory. And so this is why they ultimately ignored the safety brief and set up their first camp just a couple hundred feet away from the water's edge. And even prior to the attack on Matt, when the group literally saw polar bears wandering around near their camp, and even at one point had to fire their flare guns at the polar bears to get them to leave, the group still decided it was best to stay at this particular camp. I told you, y'all see the hat, y'all see the hoodie. And like I said, man, it'd be tough to feel bad for people in situations like this. It was like, it's not like there's a sign saying, hey, polar bears are here. You seen it? You seen it? And you stayed. Perhaps they believed their electric fence they had set up around the perimeter of their tents would protect them from these polar bears. But obviously, that had not been the case. The bear that attacked Matt had been totally unaffected by their fence. Matt would survive this attack, but really only because one of the members of the expedition happened to be a medical doctor, and so they were able to stabilize Matt until help arrived. Matt's injuries were extensive. They included a broken skull, a broken jaw. He had slash marks and puncture wounds all over his head and his neck, and all of those wounds got horribly infected. And also his voice was permanently changed as well because the bear also slashed his vocal cords. Following the attack on Matt, Parks Canada, which is the agency that oversees all of Canada's national parks, including Torngots, has mandated that any organization going into Torngots National Park has to have a polar bear protection plan in place. As for Matt, he does not make a big deal about his near-death experience. In fact, he kind of makes light of it and sometimes even makes jokes about it. As for the polar bear that attacked him, Matt holds no ill will. If anything, the attack has made him more interested and appreciative of the apex predator. In August of 2014, so 11 months after Matt's brush with death, he returned to the Torngots and even visited the actual site of the attack, perhaps to get closure. Except this time, he was in the company of an armed polar bear expert. So, that's gonna do it. If you got something out... Brother Roll, I know you watching. I know you watching. You already know how I feel about this. It's been a few stories. It's been a few where you say, how could you not listen to the signs? How, how could you not? But this one right here takes the cake. This ain't, 
This ain't ADT. This ain't, oh, you know, get some protection so no one break in your house. That is your, your whole head was inside of a polar bear's mouth. Your whole head. And you went back. Y'all knew they were out there. Y'all put y'all put a damn electric fence. That's like putting a six foot rim in the NBA. And I don't know why my damn chair keeps sinking. This, 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 this one takes the cake. This, when you just think about that, man. This man survived. You know, you, you, what was that movie called? The, the rip, that movie with Leonardo fighting a bear? This right here, though, man. You, you done got your neck broke, your vocal cords slashed, your, your skull crushed, just all this stuff. And you went back for some closure. Your closure was your ass staying alive. Oh, all right. Thank you guys so much for coming over and watching. This one was just bananas, man. So many, so... They should be ashamed of their damn selves, the damn instructors or whatever. Ignoring all right, man. Peace out. Thanks for watching.